Hey, it's Eric Newcomer. We've got a great episode for you this week. I went to Substack's offices to interview Substack CEO Chris Best and co-founder Hamish McKenzie. We had a really fun conversation. The company has released Notes, which is a, basically a Twitter copycat, though I'm sure they, they wouldn't want to frame it that way, but a micro social messaging platform, which sort of moves them further beyond just publishing newsletters like my own. I recently invested $5,000 in Substack's community round. I published on Substack, so this is the rare and hopefully just singular case where I don't have true editorial independence. I think that said, you can see I can't help myself but ask probing questions. We talk about the fight with Elon Musk and Twitter. And of course, Chris Best was on The Verge's podcast. I think by Chris's own estimation, flubbed the interview with him about how Substack would handle racism on its platform. So we get into that. So a fun and timely interview with a company that I think a ton about. So I think you'll enjoy it. Before we get to the episode, I want to thank our sponsor, Vanta, who has been such a great supporter of the Newcomer podcast. Newcomer is brought to you by Vanta. To close and grow customers, you have to earn trust. But demonstrating your security and compliance can be time-consuming, tedious, and expensive until you use Vanta. Vanta automates up to 90% of the work for the most sought-after security and privacy standards. Save time and money on compliance with Vanta's enterprise-ready trust management platform. For a limited time, newcomer listeners get $1,000 off Vanta. Go to vanta.com slash newcomer to get started. And I really am deeply appreciative to Vanta for sponsoring this podcast and would love if you would check them out, vanta.com slash newcomer. All right, now my interview with Chris Best and Hamish McKenzie, co-founders of Substack, at their offices in San Francisco. Give it a listen. Thanks. I'm in Substack's offices. This is the most compromised episode I could ever have. I've donated, you know, or invested. Sorry. sorry what the do- invested $5,000 and obviously, you know, work closely with your platform. But thanks for having me into the office and great to talk to you both. Thanks for Thank coming. You. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much to talk about right now, but Notes is obviously sort of the new exciting feature. So I'm curious... Yeah, what's what's sort of your view on how the notes rollout has gone so far? We're really pleased with it. We're pleased with how the feature works. We've been really pleased with how writers have received it. The launch itself got a little bit more attention than we expected. Is that good or bad? Most isn't that supposed to be good? Yes. I think, I think, I think on the whole, I think on the whole that it's good. I think it's on the whole a good thing. It was a little bit of chaos, but we don't mind a little bit of chaos. What was chaotic about it? The problem we anticipated having was kind of like getting everyone to pay attention to this thing yeah. that we're doing. And we sort of had the reverse problem where all of a sudden everybody was paying super close attention to it. Everybody was heralding it as this right. very exciting thing that was going on, which on the whole is great. It is very exciting, by the way. And it is very exciting. <laughs> we just, we just, we, we, we were anticipating having to convince people of that. Right. And then it, it just worked out a different way. Right. Well, I appreciate that you're coming back on a podcast after you were on a podcast before and getting grilled over like, the edge case of moderation right after launching like sort of a new (laughs) social product. So I'm glad you're back in front of the microphone. Yeah, thanks. Uh, My my view on the moderation thing is it's a lot for you. You guys are gonna have to like solve this sort of over time. Do you see yourself as a totally different company now? I guess having a notes thing, you've been somewhat resistant to like social or like how much does it change how you guys think about the company with this sort of pseudo social media platform now? I think it's a, it's an extension philosophically of a lot of the things that we have already been doing, right? One of the things we've been working on for a while is building up the Substack network, right? The idea that on Substack, you're independent, you own your connection with your audience, but also you get the benefit of being part of this network, being part of this like subscription network. People Thank are you, recommending Gurgay, each other. Thank you, pragmatic engineer. Well, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. recommendations are of many, uh, your godfather. Mine. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So recommendations are a great example of a feature that works in the network where right. it's like, hey, you know, writers are recommending other writers. They're sort of, you've got this network feature, but the humans are in charge of how it works. And we see notes as sort of an extension of that, right? It works the same way. People are allowed to, you can share short thoughts, you can share pieces of writing, you can share quotes, you can recommend stuff. Yeah. yeah. But it is, it's sort of like this multiplayer piece of the Substack universe. It definitely means that we have to update our 
sort of approach on how some of this stuff works, but it doesn't change sort of philosophically what we're doing. Yeah. Were you guys totally aligned both on, on doing it or was it? We argued for years yeah. about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've been, since we started the Substack, we thought and wanted to make it a network, not just a tool, but a tool is something you have to start with. But the big game for us has always been, how can we make this a network? How can we give people the superpowers of the internet beyond just a simple and elegant and beautiful publishing system that right. lets you collect money easily? And so Notes is a natural extension for us. Writers want to post short things and share casual content and publish some stuff that they don't necessarily want to email to all their subscribers. Right. And I think readers... And I'm both of these people, right? I'm a writer and a reader in this way. Readers want to sometimes snack on stuff from their favorite writers rather than just be in these fully immersed experiences with a long-form post or a podcast episode. So Notes is in the sweet spot for both of those use cases. So far, you know, these social networks are very much defined with how they're designed, but by who's on them. And I feel like early on, it's like, oh, it's all writers. So it's a fun little, you know, I, I like... Nerds. The vibe at the moment. I mean, that that's sort of what's funny with the like line of questioning about, you know, the level of moderation when right now you have sort of almost like overly polite, like it's too nice. Type. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I'm gonna get into the moderation question, but I wanna set it up a different way. I mean, it's sort of funny, like you're almost you're coming into this like, oh my god, it almost went too big. Like, don't you want it to be as big as possible? And really like don't you want to like present Substack as like this foil to Twitter or like, isn't this a moment where it's like you're starting to compete with Twitter? Are you not willing to lean into the like direct competition with Twitter? So I'd say there's a way that we do want to draw that contrast, yeah. right? Like we see this as almost like a battle of competing philosophies or systems. Like okay. the, the, the big vision of what we think of Substack as is this new economic engine for culture. Right. We're like, okay, there was this old class. The first generation of social media companies got built on this one model. Everything had to be free. There was this big land grab for attention. Yeah. And these giant sort of attention monster, money printing, ad fueled set of companies grew up in this age and were tremendously wildly successful at what right. they did. And, you know, I think in retrospect, that had certain consequences. It, destroyed a lot of the business model for sort of written culture and smart content without adequately replacing it with something. It created a bunch of incentive systems that pull in a certain direction. No matter what your intention is, if the way you make money is maximizing time spent and engagement because you're selling ads, the things that you end up optimizing for pull in a certain direction. It has right. certain consequences. We see Substack as a whole as being created kind of in opposition to that trend and kind of in the vacuum that's created by the evolution of that whole ecosystem. Like the way I think of this is everybody's sort of having to become TikTok, right? Right. Like the natural perfect version of the super attention monster <laughs> social Give media Give people feed. what they want. Give people what they, <laughs> and what they want, but what they want in what way, right? What they want in their basest, in their lizard brain. Right. In the thing that's, you know, the old version of it is you had to click on it. The new version of it is you just don't even have to click on it. Right. You're just like, it's just there. You're sort of staring at it mesmerized. You, you go there thinking it's going to take three seconds and you spend five hours. Right. It's the perfect, it's the logical conclusion of that whole business model of that way of interacting with the audience. We think that there's like this tremendous thing that's working there and it's going to pull everything that's in that mode of working in that same direction. You know, Instagram is going to have to become more like TikTok. Twitter is going to have to become more like TikTok. Right. And if you as a reader want something else, you're going to feel increasingly ill-served. Right. And so there's going to be this new space where you say, what if I want to go somewhere where I can use my attention wisely, where it's giving me what I want, not in sort of the back of my lizard brain of like, what will I not click ahead on? But what are the things that I value? Right. What are the things that I might choose to, you know, sit back and subscribe to on a Sunday when I'm thinking of how I want to stay well-informed or what right. do I actually want to so pay some for? Some of these subjects can almost be aspirational or it's like, this is the stuff I want to support. Like people are supporting them and it's also... Yeah, it's sort of a reason like this is. Yeah, like we're, you know, we're helping you. Ideally, we're helping you construct for yourself the media diet that you want. We're helping you 
put the things in your mind that you aspire to put there to become more the person you want to be, as opposed to kind of like eroding your defenses right. to turn you into the person that your basis self right. wants. Those are different things. So in that grand battle of ideas, then yeah, I think Substack is an anti-Twitter. I think it is an anti-TikTok. I think it is an anti, it's, it's a different idea to all those things. Substack as a whole is built on this different economic system where we don't need to keep you glued to the thing. We want to find you things that you decide you care about enough to pay for. That's not just a different way to make money from the same stuff. It's the kind of things that you make, as you know, when you're trying to succeed in that system right. are just different and better. Better by, you know, who says better? I say better. I think it's better. So it is different in that way. The other way that you could construe it though is, and the way that I think a lot of people wanted to construe it is it's like, oh, like we're mad at Twitter. Right. This is a new thing. This is the new Twitter. Right. Everyone's going to leave Twitter and come here. Right. And that's how it's going to work. And I just, that story to me doesn't ring true. Right. That's not the thing that we're building. I sort of think of it as even if we could do that, we wouldn't want to because that's not the thing we set out to build. But I also don't think that that's how these things work, right. basically. There's so much to tease. Up. I mean, in some ways, you were the free speech, arguing for free speech before you had like the Musk, Elon coming in and making Twitter pro free speech. So then there's like in terms of like the branding of the platform and the openness, there's sort of like a complicated positioning moment for us. Free speech has never been our branding. It's just something that's, really? that's like, table I feel like stakes. There was, there was a point, though, like where a lot of the conversation around Substack was about like people, free speech. People do focus on it a lot, and we're, we are proud to defend free speech. But we don't, we're not like Rumble in which we come out and say, we are the free speech platform. Yeah. We're, we're a platform where free speech is protected and defended, and that's important. But that's just table stakes for a good ecosystem for conversation. For discourse. Yeah. And we're and we're willing to stick up for it in a pinch as we've shown, but it's not kind of, you know, we see it as necessary but not sufficient to making yeah. something great. Whereas the brand is just like the writers or what is the first thing you want people to think about when you talk about Substack? I do think it's the writers. I mean, nobody comes to Substack because they want to get more email. <laughs> right? right it's not a problem people have <laughs> right nobody comes to substack because they don't have enough stuff to read because they don't, it really is you know first and foremost it's what's going to appeal to the writers the deal we can offer to writers is look you're going to be independent you're going to have editorial freedom yeah you're going to have ownership of what you're doing you're going to have a direct connection with your audience yes you're going to have free speech you're going to be able to write the things you want to write but it's this package of things that's like you're going to be able to do the work that you believe in. And if you do a good job, you're going to be able to make a living, maybe a fortune doing this thing. And the independence of that buys makes it very compelling for readers. Because the thing that readers are looking for is not a theoretical platform with X, Y, Z. It's like, where am I going to get the smartest, best, most trustworthy, the things that I value as I decide to value them? Right. Yeah, we started, like, before we settled on a new economic engine for culture, as the mission, which is an updated mission, we sort of shopped around or said a lot that we we're trying to build a better future for writing. So that system that can help writers pursue the work that they really think is important and be able to like support it by making money from reader subscriptions, it's central to why we built Substack. You can see it in every post that we've written in the history of our amazing blog on Substack.com. <laughs> I, I love you're on my newsletter promoting yours. That's the yeah, ultimate Substack yeah. dream, right? Uh, you should also check promotion. out new, newcomer.co. <laughs> you're like, Eric, you need to sell the actual newsletter better in this podcast. Yeah, please make sure you use mentions <laughs> and all the cross-posting features when oh, you yeah, publish this. Put us, in as, put us in as podcast guests in yeah. the UI. We love that. Are you trying to move beyond writing? I mean, obviously you just put in a video embedding feature. You know, this podcast is published through Substack, but like, is it truly like video and well, podcast are equal we've, to writing? Already we host a bunch of people who are not expressly just writers. Well, writing will always, and writers will always be part of the DNA of Substack and will always be central to our identity. But we're starting to say more and more writers and creators or culture makers generally, because some people are on Substack and they think of themselves as podcasters primarily or video makers primarily, or they're sort of shepherds of a community. And I think we think there's look, there's room for that to expand over time. And so I personally have a broad definition of writers. I think a podcaster is a writer. I think a, a movie maker is a writer. 
but we want to have an expansive tent that people can see themselves uh, as part of. And we think the Substack model can support all these kinds of creators. Yeah. All right. So back to notes, which I'm super interested in. I've been giving you all my feedback and like totally iterating. To me, I think I made I made a note at one point basically being like, you should give things that like help writers that get the paying audience, right? Or I think one of the complication of notes is this idea that you want the Substack platform to reward people who are writing stuff that like people are willing to pay for. But then on notes, you don't want to just, I don't know, handicap any new writer and stop them from being able to build a following because I happen to be earlier than them. How do you think about using the actual like money as a signal on notes while still keeping it sort of a platform that's appealing to other people? Yeah. Great Chris Best question. <laughs> <laughs> You've thought about this, right? Yeah. This, is, this yeah, yeah. is certainly something you're thinking about. We do think that the the money is this important signal. And for example, you know, we have bestseller badges on Substack where if you have a certain number of paid subscribers, you get a little thing. You know, the purple badge, which is 10,000 paid, is almost like more of an incentive to get to 10,000. <laughs> I mean, I want the money. Forget out of the money. Millions of dollars. Who cares I about that? that purple the badge. Bad badge. <laughs> All right. No, well, you can, is you, can't, you can't hear my tented fingers on the audio recording, but that's unlocking my Mr. Burns. Camera, oh yeah, I'm on camera. Don't forget. That thing works really well. And I think that there's a lot that we can do. You know, when we show leaderboards of what are the top sub stacks in this category? We rank it by paid. That's right. a deliberate thing, right? right? We actually, way back in the day, we had one that was ranked by like how many people liked it. And then there was instantly, there was people gaming it, right? You right. get someone that coming in and doing fake stuff or putting fake signups on their email list. And the beautiful thing about the paid subscriptions is it's like, yeah, go ahead, game it. Like figure out how to get to the top of this leaderboard. Right. Like, whatever you do, that thing is is pretty good. The thing that we don't need to do is sort of like treat that as, you know, it's not like having a lot of paid subscriptions gives you this magical superpower that, you know, you get this amplifier <laughs> where no one else is ever going right. to be heard. Right. The people who have the big subscriptions already have large committed audiences, and that's the thing that matters. We want it both to be a place where you sort of get credit for that, where you can have those signals of this is who I am on subject, this is all these things, but also where if you're someone who's just getting started, you know, you're not shut out from it. Right. Well, I guess to me, I don't have a content moderation problem on my Substack because people pay for it if they like it. And like, I'm responsive to what readers want. And like, the reason I'm successful in some way is that it's not like unbearably crass. Like, it goes beyond what any platform would reasonably moderate, right? It's like, oh, you have to be proactively good and appealing. So I, I guess the question is like, are there pieces of what make like Substack work and sort of self moderating in a way? that you can bring to notes. Or I feel like when you're pushing with the like, I don't know, it's a free for all on a like, on every edge case, I'm gonna defend what people can say on notes. Are you like embracing like the writer piece of it? Or, yeah. You know, you know what I'm saying there? Yeah, I think that maybe you're pointing at, there's a difference between sort of taking a stance in favor of free speech and a free press and not wanting to have like a centralized sort of like, censorship system. Right. There's a difference between that and saying anybody can say everything in any circumstance and that's going to be fine. Right. Right. Because that latter one is going to lead to a thing that sucks, right? Like you have a comment section in your Substack, you can limit it to paid subscribers, right. you can kick people out, you can set rules. Like delete on whatever. Yeah. And there's a little bit of like, it's your house, it's your rules. Right. To me, that is not only consistent with the sort of free speech principles, I actually think it's like a necessary, the two have to go together. Right. If you're going to have a thing that says, we're going to have a place where you can say what you want, part of that freedom is to say, I'm going to be able to set the norms in my space with my community. And we're going to be able to have a space that's not only, you know, as you say, prevents the things that like everybody everywhere agrees we don't want, but I can set the rules in my house to right. be very strict. And therefore the people that come to your comment section can choose to be part of a community that's got this like very specific norm and right. set of values. And that is actually very valuable. That actually does a better job of creating a space that people want to be than if Substack said everybody has to be polite to whatever the, right. the global Substack standard is. Because nobody wants to listen to some company, but it's like, okay, we can organize around like a creator yeah. or- you Exactly. Know, right. Like, like the, you know, if we wanted to sit up in and, and set the rules of politeness in your comment section, right. the best we could do is kind of take an average of what everybody right. on Substack wants. 
I'll tell you from experience, the result of that is you will, you will please nobody. Right. And the best you can hope for is to have people that are equally right. mad on kind of every side of everything. Whereas if we say, look, you're going to be able to set the rules. Right. You know, now not everybody in your audience will be perfectly happy with that, but it's your house. You can do it and people can choose to be a part of it and you can create something and somebody else can have a different space that has different norms. And that's good. Not only is it okay, it's, it's actively good. Now the challenge with something like notes exactly. is now <laughs> that was my next. We're sort of we're we're like right. okay, so now there's two writers interacting with each other. Right. How does that work? Right. There's places where people are allowed to publish their thing. Like how does that work? Right. And the approach that we take with this is we want to figure out how to take the parts of that former system that work and apply them to this new world. We want to leave the case where the writers and the readers are in control. And this leads to things that are actually dramatically different than what other networks have done. For example, when you do a post on notes, it's your space. You set the rules the same way people commenting on your post right. works the same way as if they're commenting on your uh, newsletter post, right? You can go and delete people who comment on your post. You can delete their comments. Mm. You can block them. You can ban them. You can, you know, you can have this level of control where you say, this is my space and within my space, we're going to kind of go by these rules right. and we're still figuring out all of the, like, there's a lot of, you know, different parts that go into that. Right. And what does it mean over here? And what does it mean if right. somebody does this and that? But in general, that's the principle we're applying. We're kind of trying to say, look, we want you to be able to set your sort of rules of engagement. Like who do I want to see? Who do I want? How do I want to be able to interact right. with people? And we want that to make kind of like, a force field that governs your experience on Substack. And that can be much more specific to the kinds of things you want to do. Like it's not just like, whatever, don't call me names. You might say, hey, I want everything to be really productive, which is the kind of standard that would be untenable to have right. as like a global well, rule. To be clear what I want from my notes, I want it to be like, you know, an Ender's game where, you know, v Valentine and like Peter Wiggin are writing on like the global forum. This is like, you know, <laughs> you and I want to come to the right. Man. I want to be able to take advantage of the fact, okay, I have a pretty successful tech one. Like, but now do I get to, I get to argue about like politics or whatever with the other, you know, I feel like that's the dream. And so right. to me, you think you should become the hegemon. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Just desk. for having such great writing. And uh, yes, to me, that means that it's like a pretty like, buttoned up i mean they're not boring but that it's you know i that's what that's why the when you hear like it's going to be totally unmoderated it sounds like the opposite of what most of the writers want which is they want to be in a place where they're like taken super seriously and like influencing the culture you know what i mean yeah i mean i think there's a difference between being able to set norms and participate in communities that have very strong norms and the idea that the way to get there is centralized censorship yeah. And I think we've come from an era where those two things have been kind of conflated and people think that the only way to get a platform to have a certain characteristic is to have a really strong sort of like centralized set of like, all right, here's the governing right. rules that affect everybody. We just don't think that's worked very well. We think there's something better that can be made here. So, you know, you got sort of pounded on the racism on the platform question. Or has your answer at all changed to what Neelay asked about? What you do about sort of a racist incident on the platform? No, it's basically the same answer. I mean, I think I did a very bad job in that interview, but I think the answer is, look, we do have a content policy. It's by design, like it, it allows a lot of stuff that we don't like. It bans, you know, only very like extreme things. If people are putting things that are against the overall content policy, they get taken down by us. However, that allows a lot of things that we find very objectionable. And then we try to build a system that puts people in control of what they see and who they interact with. Hamish, you, I mean, you worked with Elon, right? You were at Tesla. <laughs> did, you, did you interact with him personally or? Yep. Yeah. He, he hired me. Yep. What, so what's it like? You guys can't decide whether you want to be total foils to him or not. Or like, what's it like to be in a pseudo competitive situation with him at the moment? I try to think about Elon as little as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm thinking about Substack all the time, and what we're trying to do here is not build the anti-Twitter or build the anti-Instagram or anything like that. We're trying to build the first Substack, and the vision for what we think it can become is an amazing, beautiful thing, and it's bigger and more important than social media, like a social media for text or a social media for pictures or a social media for video. I spend all my time thinking about how to make that thing a reality. And it's hard just thinking about that. It's hard just to get to year five of a network 
that lets writers publish directly to their audiences and serves so far mostly just writers. So I don't, yeah, I, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking I mean, about I, that guy. To, to totally ignore the not thinking about them piece. I mean, an awkward thing about the argument at the moment is that like Twitter in some ways is trying to switch to like just charging people instead of attention. To Arguably people. Twitter's trying to kill Substack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do you make of, like the blue strategy to me, I mean, it's paying the company rather than the writer or like, how would you distinguish like the blue strategy from your approach and like how that plays out sort of differently in the product? Either of you can answer. Chris, blue strategy weird. feels totally different. It's more like medium on Netflix. Yeah, it's like you're paying for the platform. I do think in general, anything where we're setting writers up to make money from what they're doing, we're in favor of. This is you know a very important piece of what Substack does. It's not the only thing that Substack does. And this is something that, you know, we've had people try to copy Substack in various ways over the years. And often what happens is they'll look at one piece of the pie and think that that's what it is. So we went through a wave where a bunch of people looked at Substack and said, ah, email newsletters. Right. That's what's going on over there. Email newsletters are so good. Facebook did this. Right. Twitter bought a different right. company, a bunch of I think the Atlantic did something. There's oh, like, yeah. okay, newsletters. Right. We're gonna we're gonna make a newsletter thing, and that's gonna be it. And the newsletter is very important. It's a big part of what a Substack is, but it's not the whole thing, right? The whole thing is, it's your publication. You own the connection with your audience. People pay you directly. You have this independent site that you can do. You can leave Substack with your audience. You can bring your audience to Substack. This piece of that is ownership a key thing, and control. I feel like I can't. The underlying enough, it's easy for people to abstract away, but the fact that, you know, I could walk away is key yeah. to the relationship working well, you know? Yeah. It's the difference between me saying, come on, trust us <laughs> and me saying, okay, trust us. Right. Like we know, we know we have to keep and earn your trust right. because you can leave. Right. Those are just different relationships to be under with a platform. It is fundamentally different. And so, you know, I think with blue, it's not really even the same thing at all. There's, other some other monetization tools that Twitter is testing that we're excited that they're doing that. I think it helps to get people paid, but it's still not the same thing. Right. Now they're trying to create creator. Do you do you part of your delicate dance with Twitter is is it that you think writers, your Substack writers are still dependent on Twitter for audience? I don't think they're dependent on it for audience, but I think they are dependent on it in other ways. Let me put it this way. A lot of writers are just heavy Twitter users <laughs> and just like it, right? It takes up a lot of their mind right. share. A lot of our customers are or, also- Or they Twitter use it customers. a lot in spite of not liking <laughs> or they, it. Or they use <laughs> right, it a lot in spite right. of not liking it, or they convince themselves that they need to use it and then because they want to use it a lot. And even though, like, if you look at exactly the traffic stats of like how much traffic is coming from Twitter- it's really not that much. I don't know if it's that, if, 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 if you see yeah, this in your I numbers, forget. but it's like five, maybe for me. I mean, obviously my actual newsletter, people underestimate just what a large percentage it is because you're sending it to everybody every time. So that's yeah, email is your main and channel. Then, right. And then direct. And obviously Google search is actually becoming a better one over Google time. Google search is over yeah. what, I mean, the, you know, we've added a bunch of network features that are, you know, an order of magnitude right. more than the actual traffic. But all of that said, it's still a major place where people are spending a lot of time. It's still like a quality of life thing. If it just like, it just sucks. It sucks when you can't embed your tweet in your Substack newsletter. Like that should just work, right? It sucks that I can't, it doesn't, sometimes it messes with my link when I share it. It's just- Are the links, links it's painful right or what's your view, what's your sense of- how throttled it is. I do think that there is some throttling going on. I think the previews are not being unrolled in some cases. And I think in some cases it's, it's the distribution is different. You know, Andreessen Horowitz is a major Substack investor and a Twitter investor. Have you tried to ask them to broach a piece or anything like that? I mean, we've been talking to them about this stuff. We're very much in favor of a piece. We didn't start any of this. We don't think that it makes any sense frankly, for Twitter to be feuding with Substack. We'd love to not have any of this, not have any of this <laughs> annoying <laughs> bugs for writers. But at the same time, it is kind of out of our control. Just today, like coming into this, like Tucker Carlson saying he's going on Twitter and there's still like this sort of, you know, platforms are identified with the like huge creators on top of them. What sort of Substack's view right now in terms of like, courting writers. This is going to lead us to the financials that you disclose. What's the view on sort of 
handpicking writers and like the strengths and weaknesses of that for like your strategy? We have always taken an approach of going and like recruiting specific writers right from the start of Substack. When we've always had, you know, the same way that readers don't come to Substack because of Substack, they come to Substack because of writers. I think the same is true of writers in general. Like there's in every kind of pocket of people, the people that come to Substack come because of other people who are on the platform. And we've gotten to the point now, I think we used to worry a lot in the early days about getting identified with some particular slice. Like you get a pocket of this type of people and then it's like, well, all of the this people are on Substack or all of that people on Substack. I think we've successfully got to the point where it it really does feel like sort of an index fund of culture. Like you have a bunch of different slices from all across the map. People still have these opinions. I'll often hear someone say, oh, Substack, that's where, you know, that's all of the people of XYZ, but that's just their world. They just happen to know all of those people and it's one of many worlds. Right. So I think, you know, recruiting writers, helping them come to Substack, helping them succeed remains a core part of what we do. The piece where something that has changed over time is in the past, we've experimented with using money as a way to help accelerate that, Yeah, which is something that we did pretty extensively a couple of years ago, I think with great success, but we no longer have to do basically. Substack was not a big believer in new companies. You guys were willing to give me advance, but you were not like, oh, we're going to break. It might have been sort of tail end It was the particular timing of that, if I remember, yeah. But I did it anyway. But what we we did in a lot of those cases was try to push people to not take in advance because- the deal is better if you don't. The deal is you keep 90% of your right. revenue. Well, That's right. Didn't the glaciers deal. sort of get, yeah, he screwed himself. I think Iglesias is on the record being very happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's but, very happy. But yeah, but, but you made a smarter right, choice right. by comparison. Right. Well, the thing to remember with all of those, Iglesias, everybody, it, it reverted to the normal substance right. deal. So it's not like an ongoing thing, right. but there was sort of like a, a moment where we're like, let us help you get the start so that this thing can sort of right. turn over. You can see it working. We've done enough of that that people see it working now. And I don't think we have to do that anymore. But you're out sort of still recruiting writers to, to come on. It's just not financial or? Yeah, we're always trying to sort of unlock new pockets of writers and look for people who sort of fit the characteristics of who might succeed on Substack, but we're not paying advances. And partly that's because the market has changed and we've been more cautious with our resources. And partly it's because the network has been bootstrapped. Now things have their own momentum and we have network effects that add as much benefit right. for people as you know, upfront cash mine. So like 20% of paid subscriptions across Substack come directly from the Substack network now. It's a it's a huge benefit right. that you get just, you know, you don't need all that much more encouragement to come. So, you, you know, you did this community fundraise. How much did you end up getting? The maximum you can do through a community round is $5 million. Yeah. Do you have the money yet? I don't even know. I think we're actually not st- supposed to talk about the specifics of it okay. yet because of like... It's not officially to, closed. We, we have to SEC's point you at the... Right. At first there was like, oh, we're just sort of, we're thinking about... It. There, there yeah. are lots of sort of language games going on and not not specific to you, but just how it's just process weird. Works. Yeah. How do you play nicely with the SEC <laughs> type yeah, of I think we. Rules. I think I expect we'll be able to... But in the meantime, you can go to the page, you can see the things, you can see the thing. We're being very careful to like follow the rules basically. In 2021, you had negative revenue, basically. You had negative, yeah, negative revenue, which is different, by the way, than that's not just a loss. That's technically the revenue itself was negative because of the way we accounted right, for some right, of those. Right, right, right. That's why I, deals. If, if you like look at it without thinking very much, it seems absurd. Like people who want to criticize your business, it's easy to be like negative revenue. They, you know, even yeah. the top line. But, but I, think, I mean, you know, the, the story of that was we were spending money to bootstrap this network. We published a bunch of numbers around how that's gone, what that's meant for people. It's pretty clear that it it worked. It's it's that you were sort of taking a loss on these like advances to writers, and right. those come ahead of revenue, and so then you lose money totally there. And whereas if it was after twenty twenty one is an especially frothy year as well in the investment <laughs> market, <laughs> so it, it may be an atypical year. Ben Thompson, who I'm sure you guys read, sort of. I, I should have reread it before, but like, I mean, he, he still, seems to still think like people like me are like suckers for investing in this round. Or right? I mean, it was pretty negative. He has sort of a complicated subject view in that on the one hand, I feel like he wants you guys to actually control the list and thinks you should be sort of more controlled or I don't know. Any response to Ben Thompson's writing on subsect? I'll tell you what, we'll work really hard to make sure that it goes your way. And not <laughs> we can definitely do that. And we 
I have tremendous respect for Ben. Like we looked at him as one of the examples that made us think that starting Substack yeah. could be worthwhile. We talked to him in the early days of Substack. I think a lot of his thinking on this stuff is good, but I think he's wrong about this one. He can sometimes have the sort of like, I mean, he was so successful so early and it's like, oh, he, he's the one that, you know, that made it. I don't know. And like, can be skeptical about the, whether, how big of a trend it will be broadly or whether he's sort of set up a somewhat unique situation. And he's yeah. built some, he's built some cool tools in this space right. as well. Like he's. Right. He wants I, I think writers he, to I have think their he's own trying to be software. A good, he's trying to be a good faith critic and a good faith analyst. And yeah. some things uh, we agree with him fervently on and some things we just disagree with him on. Right. One thing I'm thinking about more is building like a publication on top of Substack. Like obviously Barry Weiss is like much further on that journey. There's like what the Bulwark is sort of a publication. The Ankler is another right. one. Yeah. Yeah. Pillar. What you gotta you, you gotta have the in front of the name if you're gonna do this. <laughs> oh yeah, I might not might not make it then. The um, newcomer. <laughs> add back the the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's I mean, what's the pitch to the publications and like how much I mean there's sort of a contradiction, right? And I, I find this sort of recruiting writers at the moment that I'm having to explain. It's like come to a substack, which I'm doing partially for my independence, but then like you're joining a publication or like how do you think about publications on Substack when a lot of the pitch is every person sort of on their own as their own business? I think I look at this through the lens of institutions. And I think especially in the early days of Substack, a lot of what was happening was people felt like the, especially the writers felt ill served by the existing institutions. Either they weren't aligned with how they wanted to operate or those institutions were struggling and it felt like there wasn't space in the existing institutions for what they wanted to do. And the option was to sort of like go outside and start your own thing and like be independent and, you know, create this sort of like external pressure. And I think that's wonderful and necessary. And then the other piece that I'm very excited about that can come from that is the opportunity to build new institutions. And I think you're seeing this, the seeds of this with some of the people, not every, some people on Substack get very successful and make a ton of money and are like, this is great. Like, <laughs> right. this is my perfect life. I don't want to be anybody's boss. I don't want to do this other stuff. I totally understand that. And I, you know, we will you, make your sure. Your life could be so easy, Eric, if you just <laughs> don't invite the others in. <laughs> we will, you know, we will make sure that Substack is great for those people because I think that that's a wonderful thing. But there are other people who, who say, this actually might be the seed of something new that I could start. I could start a new kind of institution that's grown up in this new world that lives by different rules and I can build something larger than myself and I can give an opportunity to other people to come and be a part of it. And we're really excited about that and we want to make sure that you can keep doing that on Substack basically indefinitely. And we right. put a bunch of work into you know, some of the, the features that help you with this. We think of it as sort of like media empire mode. It's something hmm. that we're actively building. So the more you build it, come and talk to us. We'd love to help you make it wonderful. Right. You're not against all institutions. Just, you just the bad ones. <laughs> just the ones that don't use Substack yet. Part of what's going on is like, you know, the high profile writers get to put themselves on top of these media institutions in the way that they were sort of buried under management. Yeah, it's really editors. interesting as a like writer from the bias writer perspective to see writers become owners and set the agendas themselves. I think that's a really exciting dynamic that's developing. You can even look at it sort of by analogy with what happened in tech, where it used to be the norm that the people that built the tech were sort of underlings. And at some point, that dynamic kind of flipped and they said, wait mm. a minute, like, these should be our companies. Right. You know, if this was 40 years ago, I probably wouldn't run Substack. I mm. might be like the whatever. I'd, I'd need some boss wearing a suit to tell me what to do. And it just turns out when you let the inmates run the asylum, you get more interesting results. I think the same is going to be true in media. Hmm. I had never thought about it that way, but that is super interesting. It's like, okay, the, it becomes much easier to build the actual company. So the core yeah, product skills are enough to become like a company. The, the business friction, the admin friction, the tech friction, the design friction is removed. So you can just sort of focus on the journalism itself or the writing itself. It opens up new opportunities. How much is like Substack? the company growing or, you know, I, I wish I'd seen 2022 revenue and like, what metrics can you share? I mean, my own free list is growing a lot. Obviously I'm just one business, you know, but like some of my revenue growth is off Substack, you know, sponsorships, like events. And like, 
that's net probably good for you because I'm going to hire another writer who's going to write more posts that'll probably translate into subscribers. But like how Substack the business doing at the moment? It's doing well. The numbers that we shared are... 2 million paid subscriptions million paid now. Subscriptions. Top 10 publishers make more than $25 million a year. I've paid $300 million out to writers over the course of Substack's lifetime. But readers have paid writers that, I should say. I think we crossed, what do we say, 30 million active subscriptions? It's more than 35 million monthly active subscriptions. Those are the best kind of growth indicators we can give. Obviously, there's so many lever you're trying to pull at the moment. Is it like more writers? It's the existing writers monetizing more. It's like readers coming on. It's readers subscribing to a second publication. Or like, obviously, these are all like, yeah. yes, pull all oh, these yes, levers. But, yes. but it, <laughs> give me a top of those. Like, is there one that's sort of at the top of your mind at the moment? Basically, you're listing all of the ones that are part of sort of the core growth equation for Substack. And I would say the story of the past year, let's say, has been, we took a really hard look at writers coming to Substack. Like, how are we going to get more and more writers coming and being able to start and succeed? And kind of the readers getting their second subscription, like growth from the Substack network, the place where I'm already a reader who subscribes to one Substack, do I subscribe to a second and a third? And how does that happen? And we've made huge gains in both of those over the past year. I mean, you can see this with the growth of the Substack network, 20% of paid subscribers across the network come from the network now. Yeah. And a year ago, a year ago it was 8%. It was 8%. Before that, it was 0%. And so that piece of the thing has started working really, really well. So I think we're going to keep doubling down on those areas. And then the other one that's very interesting, of course, is always just like the top line growth. Like how are we letting you bring in readers from everywhere in the right. world? Yeah. Do you have a sense of like how penetrated are newsletters right now? Have you tried to set, well, <laughs> assess what the total addressable market for newsletters is? I mean, I would imagine- Another great like, crisp based question. Yeah. I imagine like thinking about podcasts and video more, I mean, one sort of negative way to read that is that you think, well, there's only so many people who love to read and pay for reading and like people love to watch TV. Like, is there sort of a limit? This doesn't affect my yeah. business because I feel like there are plenty more elites like to chase into, but for the big, big pie, is there just like a limit of how many people will pay for newsletters? I think in the long run, is there a limit to how many people will pay? I think of it as like how many people will pay for culture that they care about, will pay for things that they value. I think there is a limit to that. It's not going to be everybody in the whole world. I do think that the limit is going to be sort of hilariously large, basically. But you're saying beyond reading. You're saying also for for watching and listening. Or... Yeah, but I think within that market, reading is actually very large. It's like a big piece of that. Like if you're looking at not just like everybody who consumes media, but who are the people who are going to pay for things that are more valuable. They're much more likely to be readers. They're much more likely to be in that universe. The thing that we keep finding is that there are new pockets of things that we maybe never even would have thought of or guessed that they exist <laughs> that start to work on Substack. Hmm. And so there'll be new- well, That was like, there was, you know, the person publishing like some book past its copyright. What was that? Was it like Dracula? Oh, Dracula Daily. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. But what, any yeah, other that was interesting a, a ones you phenomenon, seen? yeah. Well, like even Heather Cox Richardson is the number one sure. earner on yeah. Substack. Is She's a history professor who was publishing books through the academic press at, I think, at Princeton or something. But she wasn't a like, high-flying journalist or author before she was on Substack. Right. But now she's the number one earner. It's new energy that's been unlocked totally. in the universe. That, you know, the 2017 version of this question we got was, how many other Ben Thompsons do you think there are in the world? Or how many other Bill Bishops there are in the right. world? The question we never got was, do you think there's a history professor at a college whose potential has been unrealized? Right. <laughs> so, we, yeah, we think it's a massive energy unlocker. Yeah. What's the most successful, like, non-writing substack? There's actually quite a few of the top substacks that either have a podcast as part of it or are a podcast. Like Singal has like a podcast. Yeah, Blocked and Reported. The Fifth, Fifth Column, Column is on Substack. Andrew Sullivan has a podcast that's very good. Michael Schellenberger, who does public, mm. is doing more and more video, which is quite good. Josh Barrow's got a couple Josh of podcasts. Got, there's actually 
There's actually quite a lot. Hmm. I'm, I'm probably not. We could we could market it a little bit better. We should maybe tell people that we've got the best podcast platform for this kind of thing. All right. Really, you're competing you with idea. Patreon. Everybody wants to talk about Twitter, but no. I mean, I just I think of Patreon as once being the best monetization model. For I would be remiss podcasts. if I didn't say on this podcast. If you're thinking about doing a podcast, you should definitely do it on Substack. Get the emails, charge paid subscriptions. It's a tremendous place to do build a community. Are a lot of people it. paywalling the pod? I don't paywall any podcast right now because, well, I sort of, this is where, you know, I want like a YouTube channel or like in, in part to bring it back to the Twitter question, there is like you want some platform diversity That's... as a creator. And like, it's like, oh, if Twitter's going to die, then I probably want to be on YouTube. Also, YouTube is just so good at like, Totally. Gross. It's in a way that you guys are, yeah. you know. And we would encourage you to be on YouTube. We'd encourage you, you know, if you publish your podcast on Substack, it goes to all the podcasts, goes to Apple right. Podcasts, right. goes to Spotify. You should take clips and put it on YouTube. You should take clips and put it on TikTok. We want you to put it everywhere just as you want to put it everywhere right. because it becomes the sort of top of funnel for the thing you're making. And if you do monetize it with paid subscriptions, there's a cool feature on Substack, which That's allows you say. to put a like an audio paywall into the episode. So right. you send it out, it still goes out to all your main listeners. And then at 20 minutes in, they might get you interrupting them saying, hey, this is supported by subscribers. It's the only reason this exists if you want to subscribe. Yeah, you don't have to, but some people are, we we are building the tools to let you do so. And they're working really it's, well. It's a secret killer feature that we haven't marketed well. There, and I, people I'm, don't know about. At <laughs> some scale, I will. Right now, I just like want to grow it and like you know. I, 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 want, I want these subscribers to subscribe out of the goodness of their hearts. You know, pay for, <laughs> subscribe for the paid stuff. I mean, I believe in paywalls. Honestly, like my readers convert when they hit a paywall. Like I surveyed them, and I thought a larger percentage would say, "Oh, it's like the goodness of my heart. Like I believe in you." But in lo- they're like, no, it's like, I, be- I want this stuff. And like, when you deliver the stuff, I like pay for Especially it. Especially if you're getting your company to pay for it. It's easier to justify if some of the stuff is paywall. Right. It's kind of like a business expense. How ideological are you guys on ads right now? I feel the temperature changing on your views on ads. Is that wrong? Or where are you on advertising right now? I'll give you my view on this, which I would go back to that kind of like grand battle of empires picture that I painted at the start of this. To me, one of the big reasons I wanted to work on Substack, the thing that I think is fundamentally different on Substack is that when you do advertising in the way that the big social media platforms did, when you say, okay, our business model is we're going to aggregate a bunch of eyeballs and then we're going to sell off those eyeballs as a commodity so that the way that you're selling the ads are based on who the person is that's watching it, not based on what they came here for. Those things are totally disjoint it fundamentally undermines the value of the content that you have on the platform because the only value of it to the platform is that people are there. And so if you make something that's as cheaply addictive as possible, like that's how you win, that's how that dynamic gets created. And so that's the thing that Substack is kind of created in direct opposition to, right? The whole thing we want is that when you come to Substack, we're not valuing you based off of the time you spend. We're not trying to get you to trick you into clicking on things so that you do an ad impression and then that goes into money somewhere where subscriptions are very aligned with this, where you're saying, Hey, we want to find you something that you value enough to pay for. Right. Right. And you're very much in conscious control of that. I sometimes joke that people will hate read things, but they won't hate pay for it. The question that feels interesting to me is, is there something that aligns with that universe. Right. That to me feels like a more of an open question. <laughs> this seems like a long that. way to say we're no longer totally opposed. I'm not I'm not even trying to bait you. To some degree like as a creator like or whatever I am selling like ads independently because they're super tailored to my newsletter is like fine. I'm not necessarily begging you guys to get in it, but it does feel just like looking from a business like hybrid you want subsackers to make more money. Because then they're more likely to do it. And like hybrid businesses are better than pure subscription businesses. It's not totally clear that that's true. But I, I, I think the thing you're pointing out here is like ultimately what do we want? We want writers to succeed and we want them to succeed in an ecosystem that supports them doing their best work. Right. And that aligns the incentives and makes the people who are consuming it the customer. That's why subscriptions have been such a, a strong match. And that's kind of like the North Star that we'll keep following. It's... Substack at a point where it could survive without more venture funding or like, yes, it, but I mean, do you think you will raise more venture funding? 
I think the best place for a company like Substack to be is the place we're in, which is we're like, look, we have everything we need, not just to keep going, but to win without further outside capital. And should we find ourselves in a position where it makes sense to take more investment to accelerate, that'd be a great option to have. If not, we've got everything we need. That's kind of where we're happy to be. Are you guys like personally close to many like consumer founders or it feels like it's been a sort of brutal period for like the consumer startup? And obviously- We've got no friends. <laughs> <laughs> Or like, you know, I well, like the clubhouse guys like rose so hot. We just, I think paparazzi just shut down. There was like a sense that, you do know. You, do you even know what paparazzi is? I've never heard of that. It was like one of the, I think it was a benchmark. You know, it was like one of the sort of, it was a teen photo. At, you know, there have been several. I think Be Real is Be seen Real, as like yeah, past yeah. its peak, you know. I mean, Substack was always. Was, Cameo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, to some degree, you know, Substack has been sort of a tool for creators and so it hasn't been always been a pure consumer company, though now with notes, it's more hard to argue that it's I think not that a consumer the money company. makes it different. The money makes it slower to build, but also more enduring. It's not the same as kind of like a, you know, a social media app where everybody kind of like hops into it and says, this is fun and then kind of bounces. It's like, you know, it's you, first of all, you can't build a subscription business as quickly as that, as, as you probably know. Right. It can, it can be fast, but it's not going to be, you're not going to get a million subscribers overnight. But then once you have it, it's, you've got something that people deeply value. We think of it as a, as a subscription network. It's a different kind of thing than a lot of the sort of free consumer stuff. You see. Great. Chris, hey, much, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Thanks Eric. Very much. Thanks right. for having us. Yeah. Slash coming to visit us. That was our episode. I'm Eric Newcomer. This is the Newcomer Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to Vanta for sponsoring the episode. Shout out to Tommy Heron, our audio editor, Riley Kinsella, my chief of staff, and Young Chomsky for the wonderful theme music. Check out our YouTube channel, Apple Podcasts, and of course, go to the Substack newcomer.co. Thanks so much for listening. See you next week. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.